what I didn't do today? Anybody else forget this too? I always wonder if I'm going to be preaching one day and my phone's going to go off. And if it does, do I ignore it? Do I pretend like it's not me while I'm preaching? <laughs> or do I pick it up and pretend like God was calling me with something he wanted me to put in the message? <laughs> I always wonder. We'll find out one of these days because I will forget, I guarantee. <laughs> but Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. I hope that the craziness that's not Christmas is not wrecking what is Christmas for us. There's always craziness, right? Mondays are crazy because of the first day after the weekend. Tuesday's crazy because it's the day of the week. Wednesday's crazy because of the middle of Thursday, Friday. Then you got crazy Easter's and you got crazy Thanksgiving's and you got crazy family events. You've got crazy sporting events for your kids and you've got. It just it never stops. So Christmas is just another time of the year. But this is when we should really fight from letting it get crazy. Peace, peace. Joy to the world. God with us. I bring you glad tidings of good news for all people. This, of all times, is a time to just stop. And yet we go faster and faster than ever. So I encourage you, fight the battle against the push, against the more. Spend time with family. Shop. Do the things that you will do, but don't let it overtake. Don't let it overtake the holiday for what it's meant to be. If you're interested in following along with me, we're going to look at a few scriptures. We're going to start in Matthew, really briefly highlighting something that Kat just read for us. This whole Advent season, we've been talking about taking the Christmas story and making it relevant for today, bringing Christmas back to life, as it were. So we get to Christmas Sunday. All four candles lit in the Advent wreath, and we celebrate Jesus. Jesus is not still a baby in a manger. It almost should be an empty manger, maybe, in our nativity sets. I don't know how that would work. Because he was born, it's a real time, but it's like leaving him there is almost a disservice to what the story of Christianity is all about. Same thing with the crucifix. There's nothing wrong with having a necklace or a keychain or even on your wall, but Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. So it's a memory of a point in time, but it can almost twist the way you look at it if we always see him as a baby. It's like, oh yeah, that Jesus who came. That's past tense, but that's not the way he is. And all right, the Jesus who died. Yeah, but that's past tense too. So don't let our little memories cloud the big picture. Jesus is alive and well. And we here in this church, I can look around and I know from looking at faces of various people that we've experienced God's peace. Those of us here have experienced Jesus making a difference in our lives. We've put him to the test, as it were, by following him and seeing if what he says is true. We found that when we follow him, he's right on. Even if it feels counterintuitive to what we think we should do, we take his advice on something and it works. His teachings, they still live. He, the Bible says, ascended to be with God, but he gave us his spirit. So when we interact with him, we have those feelings, like we should call this person, we should help this person, we should stop and help that person on the side of the road, we should write a card to this person, we should give a gift, we should do something, we should apologize. Those nudges, it's God with us, and it still happens today. So I want to look at a few scriptures about the fact that Jesus is no longer a baby. God is not just a baby in a manger. Don't leave him there. It's where he was, but only as a prelude to what he would grow to be. And that only is a prelude for what he would do on the cross. And that only is a prelude for what he's doing right now. So in Matthew chapter 1, very briefly, right in the middle of what Kat read for us, talking about Jesus' birth, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, which is, the prophet Isaiah, the quote is, The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. That's what Jesus was. That's what Jesus is. God with us. We're all looking for that. We want God to be sort of right next to us that we could say, well, what do you think about this? Or I'm in a bind, help me out. Or can you just give me some comfort right now? I'm feeling lonely. We want God with us. Well, that is what Jesus is. But if we leave him as part of a story, a historical, fictional thing from the past, some myth that was... What hope do we have that God's with us right now? The story of Jesus is the story of God with us. And that's the hope. Flip over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Look at a couple of verses there. See the story develop. John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, 
Jesus is the word of God. He not only brought the words of God, but as we see in creation in the beginning, the word of God is a powerful agent. God says things and they come to pass. Let there be light and light comes. God's word is an active part of him that creates, that authors, that brings to life. So that word was active then, became man, was active in Jesus, and through the Spirit given to us, that word is still active in our lives today, still brings creative life to the world. So it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, he was with God in the beginning, God with God. And Jesus is God with us. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made, in him was life. Jesus brings life, not death, life. And that life was the light of man. Jesus is light. But whenever you shine light on something, you see some things you don't like. The light shows the good and the bad for what it is. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus is speaking today, but there are many that just don't understand. So there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through the light all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He, Jesus, was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. So the world doesn't understand. The world doesn't recognize. He came to that which was his, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but children born of God, created again by the word of God. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So God's word, this creative power of God, put flesh on and became a tabernacle in our midst. Remember the Old Testament tabernacle? The place, that holy place in the center of the community where God dwelled? Jesus becomes God dwelling in our midst. We rally around him. He's the center. We huddle around him for light, for warmth, for life. So because God became flesh, the word of God, God's word, God's creative power, God's being, and tabernacled in our midst so that we could interact with him, we could be led by him, we could be protected by him, just like the Jews in the Old Testament, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. He didn't begin as a baby. He came from the Father, and he's full of grace, not law, full of truth. John says, this is who I was talking about. This is the one. Law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, the key, key verse in all of this. No one's ever seen God. Even Moses in the Old Testament just saw a passing reflection of him, a shadow. No one's ever seen God, but God the one and only, the Word of God, incarnate, Jesus, who is at the Father's side because he rose from the dead and went back to be with God, he has made God known to us. That's Jesus' role. That's an active sort of thing. That's not a passive sort of thing, and it's not a past tense sort of thing. It's happening right now. So flip over to John 15, and hear Jesus in his own words explain how this works. John 15, verse 4. John 15, 4. And I know I'm going quickly through these because I want to just bring them all together. So follow along if you can, if you'd like, or just listen. But John 15, 4 says, Jesus says, remain in me. How can you remain in someone who's dead? Remain in me and I will remain in you. How can he remain in us if he's dead? No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So if he's not alive, we can't bear fruit. All of our efforts to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, self-controlled, all those things are just us. Just man-made effort. Just self-help. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Not involving God if he's dead. But if we are al he's alive and we're remaining in him and him in us, then we will do much. Verse 5, I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if he's dead, we can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withered. It just dies. There's no life in it. But verse 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. And this is to God's glory that we bear much fruit because we're showing ourselves to be Jesus' disciples. So as the Father has loved me, 
I loved you, Jesus says. Now remain in my love, Jesus says. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. Instead, I have called you friends. This is my command, love one another. God is with us, or we're on our own. God is with us, or we can do nothing. God is with us, or there's no hope. God is with us, or the Christmas story is just a nice myth. God is with us, or everything we believe is just words and stories. But the fact of the matter is, we've felt God move in our midst. I know we have. And that experience can't be traded for anything. I've talked to several of you about this lately, recently, haven't we? About how the thing that you have that you can never doubt is the things you look back on and see that God did. It just happened. Don't know how. Can debate all day the theology of why it happened or what it happened, but you can't say it didn't. In fact, there's a church here is one of those stories. I don't know how this thing ever got off the ground. I don't know how it continued. I don't know how it's here. I don't know how God blessed, but he did. There are marriages here that are only existing, only flourishing because of what God has done. There are children that only exist in this church family because God is with us. And when we pray, he's compassionate. And we have faith and he responds with miracles. So babies that never should have born, born. This is only possible if Jesus didn't stay in that manger. And it's only possible if he didn't stay on the cross or in the tomb. I've asked someone this morning, you might have seen it ahead in your bulletins, to come forward to just give us a little bit of his story. Because that ultimately is the proof that, that we look to, right? Our experience to say, does God work? And we could all stand, we could all give our story, but then we'd be here for three weeks. So I've asked one person who I know God has just been really gracious to, God's loved him really well, to come and share his story. Some of you may know it, some of you may not. But if Jesus is still in the manger, or if he stayed on the cross, then this story doesn't make any sense. Our stories don't make any sense. But take hope, take courage from knowing what God has done. And let's be encouraged together as we hear what Danny has to share about what God's done in his life. Would you come forward, brother? No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Danny's story is unique to him, but we should feel echoes of it in our stories as well because that is what God does. God sees us when we spit in his face, when we mock him, and he doesn't hate us for it. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't doom us. He's just patiently waiting. Trish was the perfect example of God's love to stand calmly and show love, to stand in the truth so that the person who was fighting so hard with the lies would have no more legs left to stand on. Romans 12 says that we overcome evil with good. Danny was overcome. <laughs> he was evil. I guess that would be the right way to say it. Yeah. But was overcome. And now, for those of us that know him, he's so good. It doesn't mean he's perfect and always does the right thing, but he has that love of God in him. And just like you said, you saw it in Trish, I know we see that in you, Danny. I know the people around you see that. You love God and it makes a difference in you. So that gives you the ability to do just what was done for you. No one has ever seen God. But when we show that kind of love, God is there. God is with us. God was with Trish, with Danny in those moments. God's with Danny. God's with us. And it's light. So sometimes the light is unwelcome when it shows our blemishes. And it shows our weaknesses. It shows our failings. But it's real. And it's much better to see ourselves for what we are than to pretend 
and to keep on hiding, to keep on pushing things under the rug, to keep on avoiding the things that need to be dealt with. The light is good. It's painful at first, but it can turn into something so amazing. That story is not possible if Jesus is still in the manger. That story is not possible if Jesus is still on the cross. And he can't stand here and say that something miraculous happened if miracles don't happen. So the question for each of us is, and I know for many of us, it's a reminder. It's a reminder of how good God is. But it's also encouragement to be like Trish with the people around us. Who do we need to quietly and calmly love? Notice it doesn't say convince. Jesus was such a good debater that he was able to convince people that he had the logical correct answer to all their problems. Not in there. He loved. Do we want to convince people into God's kingdom? Or do we want to love them into God's kingdom? Where does it say in here, I haven't found it yet, where it says if you hit someone hard enough with the Bible, some of the good stuff will just sink in. So get a good wind-up going and make sure you hit them hard. No. Danny, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I hope that for each person here, it's done one of two things. Reaffirmed that God is alive and well, and or made you feel like, I don't know if I've ever had that moment. And if so, then maybe God's still just words on a page. And that's okay. That's something. That's a step in the right direction. But I want us all to be hungry for that. I want us all to be like Danny Lee. That's the only time I'm ever going to say that. So hear it well. Say it once. <laughs> Just kidding, brother. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. We want to have what he has, not be convinced by him that what we have is bad. Or be convinced of all the things that are wrong. We know in our heart what's right and wrong. God nudges us. We need to know what's right. And we, in this Christmas season, of all people have an opportunity to say the light has come into the world and it's good. You may like it, you may not, but it is good. And God's been good to me because God is with me. I believe that. I know Danny does. I know so many of us here do. Take that with you, please, this Christmas season. Spread that news that God is good and have that joy in you. And it will be appealing to the so many around us that are angry, mocking, resisting, shamed, whatever the response may be. So music team, would you come forward? We'll close with a few songs. God is still with us. It is still Emmanuel. Jesus has given us his spirit. So let's rejoice together. It's a joyful thing. Good news that we have. Would everyone please rise as we close our service in song?